Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, I see we've 13 attendees. That's good. That's good. Uh, welcome to uh, ABTS Introduction to Inca Terms 2020. My name is Alan. I'm the senior consultant with ABTS. And what I will be doing is giving you, for the want of a better word, a detailed overview of Inca Terms 2020. They come into effect on the 1st of January 2020. But uh, just a, um, a, a general observation. It doesn't mean on the 1st of January 2020, you have to use Inca Terms 2020. You could still trade under um, 2010 if you wish. You could have a transitional period don't forget, whatever you do, don't forget to change your T's and C's um, on the 1st of January if you intend to um, do your Inca Terms 2020, um, reflecting that um, subject to Inca Terms 2020. Normally, I, I, I don't go there. I say subject to Inca Terms latest edition. So it's kind of, you're, you're covering yourself. Okay, let's start off with uh, Inca Terms 2020. And uh, Marcus, if you could pass over the next one, please. There you go. Yep. Okay. Same as the last time. It's the same as 2010. You have 11 terms of delivery, as you can see on your screen. Um, the ones on the left for any mode of transport and the four on the right for inland waterways and sea. Now, the only difference between 2010 and 2020, uh, you will notice it says DPU is the new one, and DAT is gone. So DPU takes the place of DAT. So, you know, there could be lots of moans and groans out there and saying, well, what are we, <laughs> what are we sitting here on this webinar if there's only one change, which is DPU instead of the ODAT? No, there's more to it. Obviously, there's more to it than that. And we're going to look through the changes in a, in a moment. So, it, like an overview is, you can see our old friends, Xworks, FCA, CPT, CIP, et cetera. So, the best way I can describe the changes is they're not radical changes. They're cosmetic changes with a radical change, obviously, with DPU. OK, um, so if you go on to the next one, you will see on the next slide, please. Yeah, the central issue of any Inca terms no matter whether it's Inca terms 2010 or 2020, the, the fundamental basics of Inca terms is to identify the place of delivery, the division of cost, and where the risk passes from the seller to the buyer, as it says on the screen. We never think on a day to day. We, we, we never have the luxury of sitting down in our office or in our, in our um, office at home and sucking the end of our pen and saying, mm, I'm shipping FOB. I wonder where the place of delivery is. I wonder where the division of cost is and where the risk passes. We don't have that luxury, but we should. So it's essential to understand that Inca terms full stop is about identifying the exact place of delivery where the seller delivers the goods to, and I'll explain why that's essential, the division of cost. Who pays for what? Give you an example. If I quote you CIF Tripoli Libya, 20,000 pounds, what are you getting for that money? You're, obviously, you're getting the goods, but am I shipping them? Am I clearing them to customs? You've got to know exactly what is included in that £20,000. And when you know that, you can add the other related costs to the £20,000. So let's call those costs A. So the true cost to you in Tripoli or in your warehouse in Tripoli is £20,000 
plus cost A's. And on that, you base a 100% accurate selling price, because all you do is you add your profit. End of story. So the division of cost, you must know that. You must also know where does the risk pass from the seller to the buyer? In other words, I'm uh, shipping FOB to Tripoli, and when the container arrives in the port of Tripoli and it's being offloaded, it drops and the whole cargo is destroyed. Who's responsible for that? Well, under FOB, the buyer unfortunately is. But you must know exactly where does the risk pass from the buyer to the seller. Now, that is irregardless of Inca terms 2010 or 2020. So what we're going to do now is move on. Um, somebody is saying, would you please increase Al Alan's volume? So obviously um, somebody out there isn't hearing me very well. I do apologize for that. Um, uh, I think there's much you can do about that. It's just picking yeah, up. It, yeah. it could be with respect and throwing it all back to you. It could be your computer. Okay, um, wow, we've got some people here from India, uh, Italy, um, presently in Italy, good, that's, that's nice to know. Okay, so now we're going to go into Inca Terms 2020 in particular. Up to now, I've just basically said the purpose of Inca Terms, the main purpose of Inca Terms is place cost risk. I've also said that Inca Terms 2020, that as we've seen on the screen, there's no dramatic changes in uh, the various Inca Terms, but there are a lot of the existing ones have been explained in more detail and embellished somewhat. So we will we will look at that as well. Um, you four groups in Inca Terms 2020, Group C which is CPT, CIP, CFR, CIF, Group D, DAP, DPU, DDP, Group E with our famous and everybody loves X-Works, the passive way of exporting as I call it, and the F group, FCA, FAS and FOB. So just in general speaking, from my experience, uh, the favorite ones among most traders are uh, CIF, CFR, XWorks, FOB. They, they seem to be uh, most uh, favorite. So we're going to look at those. We're looking, going to look at everything, but they seem to be uh, uh, the most favorite. And we will see as we go along, for instance, I said to you, there, there's little embellishments and little tweaks. CIF, in principle stays the same, which we will say, but it's tweaked. It's a little tweaked there. Um, FOB is the same, it's tweaked. So let's move on and we'll have a look at, well, what's new? What's new on 2010? You know, the hardcore facts. What, what's new about this? Now, I don't know how many of you out there actually have a copy of 2020 um, but I will reference pages in there uh, if you want to take note then when you do buy a copy um, you can you can refer to those notes um, welcome Amanda welcome Marco um, and uh, apparently you can hear me now that's good and hello from Berlin yeah well hello from London Okay, so what's new? What's new in Inca Terms 2020? The first one is, and I had to get my head around this one myself when I read it first until I read the actual book itself. Horizontal presentation. Okay. In Inca Terms 2010 and the previous Inca Terms, you had on the left hand side of the page, the seller's obligations. And on the right hand side of the page, you had the buyer's obligations. Now, and they went A1, A2, A3, A4, and on the other side for the, uh, the buyer, B1, B2, B3, B4. Now, in the old edition, 2010, you would have A1 on one side of the page, but B1 was, is not necessarily opposite it. So now they've just simplified it. When you see A1, you just put your eye across the page 
and you see B1. Hence, they use the word horizontal presentation. Totally cosmetic, but it's easier to read. Now, the second difference is they've addressed the problem of obtaining bills of lading under FCA. Now, to be very, very frank with you, we're going to go into this in detail later on, but to be very, very frank with you, I think this is a bit of a red herring, to be quite honest with you. And, I, and I'll, I'll justify what I say uh, when we get to FCA. So they, the problem with bills of lading being requested under FCA has been addressed. The best part of 2020, I think, is the next one. On the back of the book, you have a article by article set out of rules. In other words, um, on page 135, for those of you who are following it in your hymn book, 135, you have article by article text of rules. And basically, for those of you who haven't got Inca Terms 2020, this is a new departure and I love it. What it does is it goes through every item of the 10 items under any term. And it goes A1, general ob obligations. And it doesn't just say general obligations, but it gives you general ob uh, obligations for XWorks, FCA, CPT, CIP. So at a glance, you can see for all the 11 terms, the general um, obligations. And then it goes on on page 137 and it says, um, I should say not 137, 139 A2 delivery. And then it goes through delivery for X works, FCA, FOB, blah, 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 for the buyer and seller. So it's like at, it's like a ready retina or at a, a glance, you can find out any of the 10 terms for the buyer and the seller under all uh, 10 rules, I should say, under the 11 terms of delivery. I like it. I like it. Um, they have... The uh, use of buyer and seller's own transport addressed under DDP, DPU, DAP, and FCA. Okay, again, I'm classifying this as cosmetic. And I'll tell you why. Because if you read 2010 edition, and it's talking about collecting uh, the goods from the warehouse, um, it talks about the seller's um transport and the poor old buyer is left out of it <laughs> so obviously enough poor old buyers got together since 2010 approached the international chamber of commerce in paris france and said hey guys why don't you mention us it could be our transport so now what you have in 2010 is the recognition under deep uh, DDP, DPU, DAP, and FCA, that you could have the buyer's transport used as well as the seller's transport. So to me, that is slightly cosmetic. I'm not really uh, bothered about whose transport goes in, but they have, um, they have highlighted that. Um, the big one, the big one, and I like it, is the next one. The buyer and the seller's cost obligations have been addressed. In 2010, it gives you a vague and general rule that uh, the seller pays all costs up to the uh, delivery point, or say on an FOB, and uh, to include freight on, say, a CFR. In 2020, under A9 and A10, they actually go into it in detail, which I love. Because so many of my clients would say to me, can you make a list out, please, of my cost centers as a seller under FOB, which I would do under DDP or whatever the case may be. Now it tells you, it spits it out and it says, these are your costs. Now, I like that. I like that. 
Okay. And as you can see so far, you know, these are to a certain extent cosmetic. Problems with verifying gross, uh, verified gross mass. Okay, for those of you who are not aware of what a, a VGM is, it's this. We go into it in detail, and I, I will be showing you a PowerPoint on it, but I'm just giving you an overview. Um, since 2016, under um, SOLAS, which is safety of life at sea, under SOLAS rules, it said, we, you can no longer ship a container unless it is first officially weighed, the full container is weighed, on a calibrated weigh bridge. And you get a certificate or a receipt, a weight receipt, which you hand in to the shipping line. And you say, this container and its content is within the regulated weight because there's too many greedy people putting in a heck of a lot of, like in a 20 foot, you normally can put in 19,000 kilos and they were bunging in much more and was causing havoc at countries where the craneage was bad and they thought they were loading 19,000 uh, 19, kilos, offloading, I should say, and they found it was like 22, 23 and the crane was giving up, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they address the problem of VGM, they address it, but they flunk out. They don't actually give an answer, which I thought was particularly poor. They say, yeah, there is a problem, but mm, sort it out yourselves. You know, and I thought, well, come on, you should be telling us what to do. Now, here's a new one. This is not cosmetic. This is a new one. There are two different types of insurance required one under CIF and the other under CIP. Now, for those of you familiar with CIF and CIP in its uh, existence in 2010, we all know that all you have to do is ensure under minimum cover C, but that's changed, but we will address it um, in more detail. And finally there, they have the seller's responsibility for pre-shipment inspection, that cost is identified, and it never was identified before. Pre-shipment inspection, um, I will go into that in more detail as we go through the slides. Okay, I see there's 14 of you out there now. That's great. That's great. Um, and that's it on that slide. So what's new? So we can more or less say that there's a lot of cosmetic changes going on there, horizontal presentation. And, and then there's new ones, problems with obtaining a bill of lading under an FCA, new article by article, um, the use of sellers and um, buyers and sellers transport under DDP, etc. cetera. Um, and then the rest is, it's fairly cosmetic. So we're going to move on now and um, any any uh, questions, please bung them in, and um, I will do my best to answer them as we're as we're going along. Okay, let's talk about verified gross mass, and I, in fact, I have uh, addressed it somewhat. Um, it's getting all technical. Regulation two under SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea, 2016. It says, as I said, each container before it goes on board must have a certified weight. Of, of the packed containers, and it must be lodged with the shipping line. Now, that one there is addressed on page 13 of Inca Terms 2020. And it really doesn't address it in any great way. In fact, it, it flunks out on the whole thing. And it goes on with a big, big, big preamble uh, about uh, gross mass, uh, and it's concluded this. This is page 13. It was felt by the drafting group that obligations and costs relating to VGM were too specific and not complex to warrant explicit mention in Inca Terms 2020. Um, well, okay. You know, if you believe that, you believe anything. So basically, it is who pays for the who pays for the um, 
certificate. Well, that's works. So it would be the buyer, FCA. Uh, it could be the seller. It depends on the term of delivery and the division of costs. But I don't, on a personal level, I'm not being flippant, but I don't think that's rocket science to figure out who it sh who should be responsible. And, uh, you know, and I find it very strange that um, the International Chamber of Commerce uh, more or less flippantly kicked it into touch and said, well, you know, you have to figure that one out yourself. So, um, okay, we figure it out ourselves, depending on your term of delivery. Okay, if, if we move on um, to the next side, pre-shipment inspection. If you remember, I said to you for the first time ever, it mentions the words pre-shipment inspection and who should pay for them. And we will go into that more detail later on. But pre-shipment inspection, for those of you not familiar with it, simply means this. A buyer in Japan has bought uh, 50 million or 50,000 pounds worth of goods from me here in London. Now, I've sent them a pro forma invoice and I've given them specifications. But first time buyer, and he's not too sure, you know, you know, this guy in England, uh, how do I know he's going to ship me what I paid for? Well, of course, you don't know, strictly speaking. So what he does or they do is they will go to an internationally recognized inspection agency like a Techno Bureau, Ver Bureau Veritas Lloyds or Intertech. And they say to these people in London, hey, do us a favor, go into ABTS training, their warehouses in central London and inspect my cargo. And if everything is okay, issue a clean report of findings. And if things are not okay, fail them. Give them a non-negotiable report of findings. And I cannot ship it unless I have a clean report of findings. And I certainly won't get paid. So that's what pre-shipment inspection is. Now, it was never mentioned by name in Inca terms, but now it is. And it says, who should pay? And basically, it's always the seller with the exception of X-Works. Uh, next one, please, Marcus. Yep, there you go. Right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start up and just look at the groups. The uh, four groups that we have. And we're going to look at the first group is uh, group C. And we're going to look at CIF and CFR in particular. Now, please bear in mind that this uh, webinar is an overview. It, it is not a tutorial on each term of delivery. It's giving you a flavor and hopefully um, making you feel that, yeah, I can, I can approach these and give you the confidence to approach 2020. So we're going to just look at CIF and CFR. So if you can move on, please, uh, Marcus. Yeah. Okay. CIF, as we, most of you, I'm sure, know out there, cost insurance and freight to named port of destination. Okay. Place, still the same as 2010, place on board the vessel, risk on board the vessel, and the cost to the named place. Now, it is covers it is covered by clause c insurance please don't worry if you don't know what clause c insurance is because i'm going to address it in detail uh, in a few minutes okay now nothing has changed there absolutely nothing has changed there it's still the same on board the vessel on board the vessel to the name place clause c insurance but i would bring your attention to the notation in 2010 and 2020. In 2010, it says CIF may not be appropriate when the goods are handled to a carrier before they are on board the vessel. In such circumstances, the CIP rule should be used. And then if you go down, in the terms 2020 says, when the goods are handed over to a carrier at a container terminal, the appropriate rule to be used is CIP. In 2010, they said, 
suggested, they say, may not be appropriate. I, I've done that in red, you can see that, may not be appropriate. They didn't bash the fist on the table and say, you can't use it when, you, uh, when the goods have been delivered into a terminal before they go down to the dock. But in 2020, they say the appropriate rule to be used they, they don't actually give you um, any leeway on that. And they say it should be CIP. Now, okay, let me explain that because although it was around in 2010, it always gave me a bit of a shock. I'm sure all of you out there are very cognizant about shipping a 20 foot container. A 20 foot full container load. 20 foot full container load, the empty container goes into the warehouse, it's packed. The doors are closed, a seal is put on it, and it goes direct to the vessel. To Felix Stowe, in my case in the UK, Livorno in Italy, wherever, it, it's, going to, it's going down there. It's not touching a terminal, it's just going straight down to the docks. But if you were sending LCL, less than a container load, that contain, those goods might go on local transport from your warehouse in London, go to a container base in Birmingham, where they are stuffed in a container with maybe 30 or 40 more consignments, the container is locked, sealed, and sent down to the dockside. So that's what they're referring to when they say CIP might be the best. I have put in there LCL for LCL because in both 2020 and uh, 2010 and 2020, it can be very misleading because the vast majority of people shipping in containers use CIF. And a lot of them so far who have never read it in 2010 have seen it in 2020 and said, oh my God, we can't use CIF anymore. We've got to use CIP. No, no. All 2020 is doing is saying if it is going to a um, inland terminal to be stuffed, they, they don't use that word, but to be stuffed, um, you know, the, the, Appropriate rule for that is CIP. So the departure and the change from 2010 to 2020 is the wording, it's semantics, it's the wording. In 2010 may not be appropriate. In 2020, the appropriate rule to use is CIP, more firm, more definite. But um, I underscore this by saying, um, as far as I'm concerned, that is for LCL, shipments. Um, so that is a change. Now, if we move on, please, Marcus. We're going to talk about marine insurance because remember I said marine insurance had changed, but under CIF, it remains the same, clause C. So you have marine insurance under CIF, minimum cover, clause C, and bingo, here's the new one. Marine insurance under CIP is all risks. Now, CIF and CIP in 2010 were the same. Clause C, minimum insurance. So this is brand new, and this could catch somebody out if they don't read the book of words, if they don't uh, read 2020. Because under 2020, uh, CIF and CIP have their own cover, where before they were both minimum cover. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at all risks and minimum cover so you have an idea. Uh, if we could move on, please. Marcus, there we go. Yeah. Now, clause A, which I haven't uh, put up here, clause A is known as all risks insurance, which is self-explanatory. You're, you're insured for everything. You name it, you're insured. But of course, like all insurance, our private insurance, our house insurance, our car insurance, there's always the small print. So there's exceptions. 
under uh, Institute Cargo Clause A, B, or C. And they have uh, lots of exceptions, like insufficient packing, et cetera, et cetera. But Clause A is very, very easy. All risks. This consignment is insured for all risks. It's the Rolls Royce of marine insurance. The worst marine insurance, if that is the right name, is Clause C. You're not covered for all risks. You're covered for specific things only. And you can see on your screen, on Clause C, you, 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 you get cover for fire and explosion, stranding of the vessel, a grounding of the vessel, capsizing or overturning of the vessel, derailment of a land conveyance, collision other than water, discharge at the port of distress, and jettison of cargo overboard. Now, I'm just going to zoom in very quickly on two, let you know what they are. Discharge of a cargo at a port of distress. A port of distress is this. You're going from country A to country B, and you've got your insured under clause C, marine insurance. But you can't, the, the vessel cannot get in to the quayside at company B. It could be the cranes have broken down, um, the actual uh, quayside is silted up. It can't get in there. So instead of going from A to B, the cargo for B is dropped off at the nearest port, C. So what it's saying, even if the cargo was dropped off at C, you're still insured. That's what it's saying. Now, the last one is jettison of cargo overboard. Jettison of cargo overboard, which is nigh on impossible in a container vessel nowadays, is when the container is physically kicked overboard, to use a very non-technical phrase. Um, and that is... If a container um, has, a, has a cargo and it gets it, it ignites, or the cargo inside is shifting, and that container is in danger of endangering the vessel and the other cargo, uh, in theory, it's kicked overboard. But if you're in a stack of eight high and nine wide, and you're in the middle of that stack, it's impossible to get rid of it. But you know, let's not go down that road too much. So jettison of cargo overboard, you're covered for. But what you're not covered for, which is in all risks insurance, is washing overboard. And believe it or not, uh, certainly on a weekly basis, containers are washed overboard by 40 foot waves. We don't read about it. And we don't hear it on the news because it's, it's not really exciting news. But if you buy a trade magazine, it's all over the trade magazine. Or if you read Lloyd's List, it's always in Lloyd's List. So in trade magazines, etc. So you can see Clause C. Now, I don't like using this expression. It's very unprofessional and very unbecoming for a person of my old age. But it's kind of Mickey Mouse insurance, Clause C. So you know now that instead of having Clause C, as it used to be for CIF and CIP, now they've divided it. So that, that's uh, marine insurance. Um, if we could go on, please, Marcus. Okay. Do you remember I said to you that on an LCL situation, um, on a, a CIF, LCL situation, um, Inc. Terms 2020 said it was appropriate to use CIP. Okay, well, here's CIP. The delivery and the risk passes when the goods are handed to a carrier, the truck. So you can see that um, you have a very short risk and delivery factor. So the truck comes in um, to pick up your consignment, LCL consignment, to bring it down to an inland uh, depot, you, your risk and your cost finishes when they pick it up. And of course, it's clause A insurance. 
Okay, so that is why they're saying instead of CIF, use CIP. But they've also said that in 2010, but they weren't so dogmatic about it. They weren't thumping the table and saying it. In 2020, they are. And it's, it's one of those rules in Inca terms, full stop, that not many people read. They kind of are inclined to overlook it. Okay, if we could move on, please, Marcus. Cost and freight. See, our old friend CFR. Cost and freight is the exact same as CIF, except you don't have the I in the middle. You are not insured. Okay. Cost and freight name port of destination. Delivery on board, risk on board. Now, please note, in Inca Terms 2010, it say may not be appropriate when the goods are being delivered to a terminal, in such circumstances use the CPT, again, for LCL. And then on Inca Terms 2020, the appropriate rule to use is CPT. Do you see, again, semantics. The first one may not be appropriate, but now our new book is saying the appropriate rule to use is CPT. Yeah, just pure semantics, but uh, and that is for LCL and certainly not for FCL consignments. I hope all of you out there, all 14 of you, know the difference between FCL and LCL. Let me just very quickly give you a gallop around that. FCL is when you load a container at a warehouse with your product. In other words, you're um, hiring the container for your product, you're sticking in 33 cubic meters worth uh, in a 20 foot of goods. An LCL is when you use a 20 foot container, but you co-load with maybe 20, 30, 40 different companies and you're all using uh, containerization, but on a different level. So that's LCL, less than a container load. Okay, um, I'm, I'm just quickly stopping and looking to see any questions. Either you haven't a clue what I'm saying because I'm not very good, or I'm very good and you understand everything. But I, I've, I've no questions coming in. Uh, that's fine. If you have any questions, uh, you know, please put them in. Um, and please don't uh, preempt your questions by saying, I don't want to write this down because all the other 13 people will know the answer and I'm the only one who doesn't trust me they won't so you go on ask any uh, questions you want and I will do my very best in the time available to answer your questions okay right uh, if you could move on Marcus please yep yep okay now we're looking at the D's DAP the new one DPU and DDP. Now, just to do a fast forward on these, the new one, DPU, is delivered at place unloaded. Very, very important. Unloaded. DAP, the goods just arrive on the truck and the buyer has to offload. DDP is the same. But with DPU, when the truck arrives or the container arrives or whatever it is arrives, it has to be unloaded. And that is when um, risk passes uh, and delivery passes unloaded. And you might say, well, mm, OK, let me give you an example. Two weeks ago, um, we had a client of mine had a consignment coming in from Turkey, a 40 foot container. And they wanted the client in England wanted a DDP unloaded. Yeah, he set up his own little rule of unloaded. Now, it was very easy to unload because they were feather light, big boxes, but they were feather light. And it was dead easy to unload them. You know, just went up in a forklift truck, went in and unloaded them down to a colleague and they brought them into the warehouse. OK, now with DPU, that's, it's the same thing. You have to unload. But let's think, let's use a gen set. 
you're sending a gen set and it's a 40 ton gen set and it winds up coming into the factory which is the place of delivery on a low loader 40 tons who pays for the crane to offload that under dap the seller under ddp the seller but under dpu i i should say my mistake on the dap the buyer under ddp the buyer my apologies but under dpu the seller so the seller in england has to arrange through the the buyer in tripoli libya for a crane to be there to offload the 40 ton um gen set so it is it is very very important so dpu the new guy on the block is the only term of delivery where the seller has to arrange unloading at the final destination wherever the final destination is now beyond that um if we can move on please marcus we'll yeah yeah we're going to look at ddp now deliver uh, DDP. as you know uh, some of you might be aware ddp is like a, a dhl parcel coming to your hall door um, or a Amazon, it's door to door, except it could be a 20, 40 foot container, or it could be six 20 foots and six 40 foot containers, but delivered duty paid. Now, here in 2020, it's addressed for the first time. That is paying import duty and VAT. Now, if I'm in in the UK, which I am right now, and I'm sending a 20 foot box to Tripoli. Okay, Tripoli, Libya, I'm sending a 20, I'm sending it down into Sebha, which is kind of in the middle of Libya. And it is DDP Sebha. Okay. Now, when it hits Tripoli, if it's going into the port of Tripoli or Benghazi for that matter, um, it has to go through customs. <laughs> By a show of hands, <laughs> could you please put your hand up and tell me how much is the import duty for a 40 foot container of men's shoes into Tripoli or Benghazi? None of you know, including me. So when you're doing your costings for a DDP, it can be very, 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 excuse the word in the vernacular, dodgy, because you've got to make sure in your selling price includes customs clearance fees, in Tripoli and import duty in Tripoli. So 2020 recognizes this and it says, if the seller cannot secure customs clearance or import license formality in the buyer's country, DAP or DPU rule should be considered. Not thumping the table and saying you've got to do it, but should be considered. I think that's a very, very, very good um, piece of advice because I always find my clients when they're shipping DDP and they're asking for advice, you know, I'm always in nervous mode because if I don't get every cost center, including import duty and uh, on carriage and local taxes, if I don't get those right, um, I don't think they would use me again as their consultant. But this way you can, you can circumnavigate that by saying, um, we'll do DDP, yeah, no problem, but we want you to uh, organize customs clearance and pay VAT, or we'd go down the DAP, DPU road. Okay, everyone? Right, if you could move on, please, uh, Marcus. Um, just uh, the new rule, DPU, delivery at name place, unloaded, risk, named place and the costs i put this in for the first time as per a9 and b9 in uh inca terms 2020 because a9 and b9 for the first time as i said when i introduced the u2020 actually tells you the costs in detail so i love that it saves me telling all my clients and writing out 
the cost for them. I just say go to A9 and B9, depending whether you're the buyer or the seller, and you'll find your costs. Okay, if we could move on, please. Yep. Okay. I'm going back to I'm going to X Works now. Our all favorite X Works. Everybody loves X Works, the passive way of shipping. You don't have to ship. You don't have to know um, the first thing about where Tripoli is or uh, where the Spezia is or anything. You don't have to know that because you are selling X your warehouse. Um, and it, it's, it's up to the buyer to do everything. It's the passive way of exporting. Now, first of all, it doesn't have to be the your warehouse. I could be in London and I'm selling from a warehouse in Liverpool. So it'd be Xworks Liverpool, although I'm down in London. So it doesn't have to be on the seller's premises. But there's always a sticking point, particularly here in the UK, if I'm selling X works and my client again is from Libya and he wants something to bring down to Sepa, he's bringing some uh, pipe fixtures down to Sepa and um, he's buying X warehouse London Central. Now, I know and he knows that he's going to organize these with his clearing agent or his freight forwarder and they're going to air freight them. So, strictly speaking, I'm saying, well, I don't vat this guy because they're going out of the country. Now, there's always been this big dilemma. Should I vat this guy? And if the vat man asks me prove they've gone, I can't. Or if I can vat him, I should say. And then when he gives me proof, I will give him his VAT back. That's messy. That really is messy. Nobody wants to deal with a company who does that. Or should I zero rate him? And then if the VAT man asked me to prove that they went out of the country, by then I'd be able to get some bit of paper from them. That was um, the general way people went about it, okay? So if for zero rated invoices, you need proof of export. And the proof of export from the UK, now I appreciate you're not all in the UK, but for obvious reasons, I can only speak about the UK, um, is in HMRC, Her Majesty's Customs, note to 703, as you can see in the screen, uh, I'm getting very technical here, section 7.1, it says quite simply this, if you're selling X works, and you can get your hands on a copy of an airway bill or a bill of lading from your buyer, bingo, you're okay, you can zero rate them. That's the point I want to make. And in 2020, I think they make a bit of a pig's ear about it. They go on about, you know, it's so hard getting um, a um, proof that the goods have left the country. I don't think they do personally, but uh, who am I to say that against the International Chamber of Commerce? Okay, Marcus. Okay, um, as I say, X Warehouse is place X Warehouse, risk X Warehouse. If you could move on, please, Marcus. Okay, and the full F group is FCA, free carriage two. FAS, free alongside ship, and FOB, free on board. Could you please move on, Marcus? Okay, I want to address free on board. Free on board, as we all know, is the places on board the vessel, the risk is on board the vessel, and the cost is to on board the vessel. Now, Inca Terms 2010 said, FOB may not be appropriate when the goods are delivered to a container base. LCL, our old friends, LCL. Inca Terms 2020 says, FOB is not the appropriate term to use when the goods are delivered to a, term, a, a, a container terminal. And what they are saying, and which you cannot see there on your screen, is you should use the FCA rule. So, 
you can see on CFR, CIF, and FOB and X Works, uh, they, they are more positive. The International Chamber of Commerce are more positive in 2020. And they're not wishy washy like may not be the appropriate. They are saying is not the appropriate. So watch that. Watch the, the, the little embellishments because it's quite easy to drift through 2020, but you're reading it through the eyes of 2010 because there's not much difference. And you, it's the minute of 2020 will catch you out, not the technicalities. It's just the may not and is not. But it doesn't mean you cannot use any of those terms for LCL, FOB, CFR, CIF. There's no reason you can't use them, but they're saying it, it prolongs the agony of the risk. That's all they're saying, and cost. Okay, if we could go on, Marcus, I'm about to uh, finish. Oh, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, folks. Thank you, thank you, all of you, uh, 14 of you, to, uh, for listening to me. Now, what I set out to do is give you an overview and to allay any fears that you might have that 2020 is going to be, oh, my God, this is going to be difficult. No, it's not. Ten of the 11 terms are the same. You've got one new one, DPU. But in those 11 terms, there are certain ones that have been embellished. Watch the small print. That's all I have to say to you is watch the small print. I'm going to finish there and I'm going to thank you all for your attention and for joining us. Um, what I, <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome, Brit. Um, what I would say is, and uh, this is the sales spiel at the end of this small course. Uh, as you know, we are running our online, or I hope you know, we're running our online international trade course. At the moment, it's closed um, for applications. We just do it in tranches. We open it up and then um, we allow so many people in. Then we close it for about six weeks. We're just about to open it again before Christmas. It certainly won't be opened until after Christmas. Uh, so if you are interested in looking at international trade from a wider angle, about bills of lading, airway bills, et cetera, et cetera, letters of credit, negotiating skills, please go on to our website, abtslogistics.co.uk, and just to have a look at what we do. And if you find it interesting, you may join the course. If you have any questions about the course, contact me and I'd be only too happy to answer your questions. So I'm going to close down here. Um, oh, yes, indeed, David. Uh, the course will be updated to include, uh, to include Inc. Terms 2020. It has to be. So on the 1st of January, uh, on the next tranche, um, you will have a couple of tweaks on the module on Inca terms, bringing us up to date. So in one, David, yes, yes, it will be. It has to be. Um, we, we couldn't run a course that's out of date. So yes, it will be. It will be. And don't forget with the course, you get a free helpline, which can ring any time. So if, you, if you're not too sure of your Inca terms, even after listening to me here, don't worry, because you've got a free helpline. I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, it's 10 to 7 in the UK, so I'm going to say good evening. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, very, very uh, fast webinar on Introduction to 2020. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Alec. Thank you, Amanda. And um, best of luck to you, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye now.